It's been a while, but this playthrough is back. Welcome to chapter three of my Vestari Saga Clemency Mode low turn count playthrough. Uh, I have no real excuse for being gone so long other than laziness, but my motivation to complete this runs back, so hopefully there will be some semblance of a consistent upload schedule. We ease back into things with a pretty simple map in chapter three, which is also one of my least favorite in the game. It is a defeat boss chapter. It is relatively small and there's not much threatening in between us and the boss, so it's really just Troy and Merida running them down. When playing this chapter normally, there are quite a few side objectives. Uh, there are three chests, each of which has a specific gimmick on how to get. Uh, the one to, in the bottom right has a dragon guarding it. The one in the center, you need to get a different key and then use that on the door to get the contents therein. And the one in the top left, you need to break the rock with an axe, bro, and then have Caesar loot it, what's inside. Um, due to time constraints, we can only get the leftmost chest, which is good because it has the best loot of the three, which is the multi-chance tome, which is one of the multi-attacking skills. And we need to give it to Merida because though she has pretty good offense and lots of options for killing things uh, in between magical weapons and the dandelion and the legendary cutlass. She does sometimes have strength problems and we can't afford to always be using the war goddess sword or dandelion. So it's good to get it. So it's good to give it to Merida because she does so much for us. Another side objective that we that you could go through in a slightly slower playthrough is having Sheila talk to the top left uh, to one of the bandits in the top left, which will get you a cutscene afterwards where we obtain a um, liquid agility, but we don't have time for that. Uh, as a bit of a relic from my earlier way of thinking, I recorded this months ago, a month ago, I thought that Sheila needed to be fed some, some kills to get to chapter to get to level 12 to do some things for us in chapter 9. Thankfully, that won't actually be necessary, and Sheila will hit the bench after this chapter where she gets a few kills she doesn't really need to. It, in retrospect, would be better to give those kills to Dune, but at the same time, it isn't a huge deal. There's more than enough experience in this game, and with a few notable exceptions, stat benchmarks aren't too tight. Uh, Another thing is that most of the bandits and thieves fleeing to the south have items like jeweled knives or coin pouches. It would be nice if we could block them off and get all of their loot, but unfortunately Troy and Merida are the only people who can block off and kill all of them before they escape and they're needed in the north. So we take what we can for them, collect a bit of money, and, and call it a day. This jeweled knife one that I just missed if I weren't hung up on training Sheila or I were less lazy and reset I could have gotten the, their jeweled knife but it won't be necessary so we get one last heal in and then Troy goes and destroys the boss with the cutlass uh, going through all 52 points of health with ease because he is that good And with that, we are out of a smelly Galashian cave and onto the main attraction of the video and why you probably clicked it in the first place. Yes, it is chapter 5, where we attack the walled city of Venetia. This is the first... This is the first chapter of Astaria Saga that really shows you what the game is about. I mean, to an extent, it's chapter 3 that does that, but this is really... This is really the place where it first gets real with like levers and taking boats to sneak behind enemy lines and all these different conditions you're meant to fulfill in order to finally get to the seize point. Um, you're also supposed to charge a little girl to talk to extremely powerful mercenaries in the middle of the map, just all kinds of weird things going on, which can make this map feel like somewhat of a puzzle the first time through. Um, however, when we play it, it's a lot simpler. We just break down the gate. So, Merida is talking to this young girl, 
who we tell we're going to escort her back to her father. And this is what you typically do to take a boat to the dock area where you slowly work your way around to open the gates to the city. Uh, however, we just talk to the girl to get the Ring of Bliss she gives us, which negates crits on the wielder, and tell her to stay by Merida and we'll safely take her back to her father, but Merida just takes the girl and charges into the heart of battle. So, Syed has already been doing some work on the gates, attacking the people behind the walls. Lore-wise, no army has ever managed to pierce the gates of Venetia, and Master Garland, being a very good tactician, is not going to try what has failed historically and hope that it somehow works. So instead of attacking Venetia with an entire army, he decided to attack it with a single Zayed, a strategy which you will see works admirably. Um, in the meantime, a group of enemies charges us, but there's not much to say about them. We just dole out the experience to people who need it. Uh, so the most scary enemy guarding the gates, and what normally stops people from from attempting this method of the map, of approaching the map, is that there is a Nim sorcerer. Nim is a very threatening two to three range brave dark tome that om that will one round pretty much everyone in our army. Zayed is the only person who can take it without dying. Thankfully he didn't have to because he crit the sorcerer, but he would have taken a lot of damage. And other than that, we just slowly open the doors. Now, in the top right is where most of the action of the map will shift to now that we've cleared out the gate area. We were just joined by three eagle riders, which are basically Pegasus knights that don't make Kaga legally liable. And Kaga, it seems like he was trying to balance flyers in this game. He gave them very low caps, not the best stats, uh, and only six move, which is the same as a lot of infantry. So they don't have huge move and huge ability to evade terrain, they just have the latter. Unfortunately, that didn't really seem to work out for a variety of reasons. First is that cutlasses are viable in this game, and Eagle Riders have the very powerful Doyen, which is a 1-2 to two range brave spear, and they can also use magic weapons with some effectiveness. So, essentially, as long as they come properly equipped, and you don't overextend them, Eagle Riders can do everything you would want a flyer to do. And as a result, Yeri and Rubina, who are the two Eagle Riders who joined us permanently, are going to be staples of our team going forward. The, what they are tasked with is, in the middle of the map, you see a promoted swordswoman and an axe master. These are very powerful enemies, their names are Marlena and Bjorn, and Lore-wise, they're supposed to be somewhat nice, good mercenaries who just happen to be caught up with the wrong team. Normally, if you wait long enough on this map, a character called Nina, who appears in the top right, and if you waddle her over to Marlena's attack range, and I do mean waddle, she has three move, Marlena will then go and attack her and miss every attack, and then they'll decide they don't want to be killing little kids and they'll defect. However, though we ha don't have to go all out on this map, there is a bit of a turn floor in place. Um, we still do have to kill them. We can't wait until Nina comes out. Um, and some people would be very sad about this because they say, oh, they're good people. How could you do this to them? And to that, I must respond with a quote from an American president, which is, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. Fool me three times, can't get fooled to get. And people might ask, what do you mean by that? And what I mean by that is they fight on the wrong, Marlena and Bjorn fight on the wrong side once in Venetia. Then later in this game, they fight on the wrong side again. And then in the sequel, this game, uh, Holy Sword of Sylvanister, they fight on the wrong side a third time. So they can't get fooled again, yet still side with the villains. I can only 
conclude that they're bad people, and killing them here now is the wisest course of action. Marlena is extremely strong. Uh, she will one round, I believe, everyone in our army. However, we can pull Bjorn by having Aslan, the strongest of our eagle riders, camp out above a house so that Bjorn comes out and throws an axe at her. Things are a little precarious for Yeri and Aslan at this point, simply because archers have begun streaming out of the houses and out of the gates, and while effective damage isn't as good in this game as in a lot of others, it's still enough to two-shot our frail eagle riders. So we cannot go and attack Marlena immediately. We're going to burst her down at range with the Doyen so that we don't have to deal with her powerful offense. Um, however, there's still the issue of the archers, but we can do a pretty tight maneuver to pull the archers away, which is Marlena can walk up to Merida technically, but the Arbalest steer standing on the forest will not move, and that's the only square from which Marlena can attack Merida. So by having her stand there and not kill the Arbalest steer, she be is close enough to pull the archers away from the eagle knights, but but not close enough to get killed herself. Um, it only helps reliability a little bit, but I did like that. And, you know, there aren't the best hit rates on Marlena. She's very dodgy. Not as dodgy as she would be if she were near her uh, departed Bjorn, but so be it. So now come the map slows down a lot. In one of the shops near the starting point, you can buy door keys. So you would think that in order to get through the gates quickly, we would want to buy door keys and have people other than Cesar picking the locks. But this isn't necessary because we cannot reach the seas point until a bridge lowers. Um, and the bridge lowers when the two conditions are fulfilled. First, Zaid has to cross the bridge near the top right mansion, and it has to be at least turn 12 player phase. And as a result, we do have time to just chill out. We don't have to have everyone move their maximum move every turn. We can take our time now. Uh, and we're going to do that to shop. Um, Rubina already buyed some more cutlasses, which she's now using to train her level. You'll, she got really lucky with her levels and got a lot of strength, which is, it doesn't happen all the time. Her strength is not incredible, which is very good because in the next chapter, the two e Eagle Knights are going to see a lot of combat, and only one of them can have the Doyen at a time. So it's good to have one of them gain a lot of strength, which Rubina did, so we're good in that regard. Um, there is an important item that we get in this map, which is the Champion's Mark, which promotes a non-magical foot unit. and. This is the only promotion item we get for a long time, so the choice of who to promote is quite important. Um, for the purposes of a low turn count playthrough, you typically want to promote either Dune to help in Chapter 9, or Ash to help a lot in Chapter 6. Um, and I decided that the benefit of promoting Ash was greater, because he also helps more than Dune does in the maps other than Chapter 9. So it felt good, like a good idea to just give the first promotion to him. Which will make him one of our best light infantry units with 7 move and ability to walk on cliffs, which will be put to use very soon. <coughs> we are also going on a selling spree of all our expensive items because there's the first rarity shop here. Uh, rarity shops pop up from time to time and they sell nice and useful items. At this one, we can buy war picks, which are brave axes, and far healing staves, which are essentially physics. So we don't have a huge amount of money because we did buy a lot of cutlasses and war goddess swords, but we do manage to pick up a far healing staff, uh, a war pick, and some nice and a few decent tomes. Um, and 
Ash, just with terrible hit rates, goes and bothers a healer who drops a heal staff, which we don't really need, but it's nice to get Ash levels, though he's soon going to look very strong. Unfortunately, the purple-haired wyvern uh, eagle rider on our team, Yer uh, Aslan, leaves after this chapter. According to the lore, she is the captain of the Knight's Accolade, which are the air force of the country of Vesta. Even though her base stats aren't god tier, they're very good, and she has a skill which gives her guaranteed crit on counterattacks, so it's probably for the best that we don't get to keep her. It would be a bit overpowered. She shows up very late in the game, but is useless there, so... Basically, she helps save us some turns by murdering a mercenary couple, and then rides off into the sunset. All that remains now is to concentrate everyone on the bottom area. Currently, it's not too densely packed with enemies, there's just the boss Vilweiss and a few archers, but soon when an event triggers, there are going to be a lot of people there. Uh, in the top right, we're about to see Nina spawn, who is a 10-year-old girl who can heal and do nothing else. This is the only time she shows up. She triggers a game over if killed. Um, her, The advantage of using her in this map is that she can pull Marlena and is hard-coded to not get killed by Marlena, even though, based on stats alone, Marlena should absolutely demolish her. Um, so, but we skipped that this time, and instead she just sits there and gives away her heal staff. Um, because the, we know the bridge won't go down for a bit, we can pretty safely position our eagle riders ready to... Um, to dive in. Uh, and we also set up a trade chain to get the champion's mark all the way over to Ash. Uh, I don't know if I actually needed to promote him this this chapter. You can't use items in the preparation menu. I don't think he needs to be promoted by turn one of the next map, but I didn't have much else to do, so I decided to set it up. So there is a 13 turn floor on this map because the bridge to the Seize point does not lower until turn 12 player phase at the earliest. So all our soldiers charge in and use their best weaponry to burst down the enemies. There are actually some pretty strong people here. There's a there's an archer wolfgang with the Seratim bow, which is a times four brave weapon, uh, and it has 80 uses. Thankfully, he drops it and. This is going to be one of the best weapons for our archers. Otherwise, we play past the Doyen around and take down the archers because those are the most threatening to the Eagle Riders. And besides that, it's just the classic Troy and Merida duo. The boss of Vilweiss is actually quite difficult to take out fast. He has a stun pillum which is a javelin that can paralyze people, and an adept blade, which is what it sounds like. It's a blade with high might that has the brave effect. Um, and he also has a lot of defense and health. Normal and Theodel is nowhere to be seen, but we kind of pile on him with all our attackers, and it works out okay. One way you can get a game over is if all of the senators are killed by the f by the executioner, but there's no way that can really happen. Um, I've never seen it happen even casually. It, it just, you'd have to play extremely slow. Uh, here I dither for a bit about how to take out this boss, because I didn't think that far when playing. I, in retrospect, probably should have had Theodel come here instead of collecting kills elsewhere, but... I realized that even though he only deals 3 damage per hit, Troy, with his triple threat stacked with the times 2 attacks of the cut Cutlass, can get a lot of damage in. Um, so we pelt him a bit with the Doi and trade over a new Cutlass to, to Troy and go to town on him. Um, 
we give the final kill to Merida simply because, well, she needs more levels and she even is going to get a much coveted point of strength, which is good because I don't want to have to rig for it, but she's having strength trouble this playthrough. Um, and with that, chapter five is going to be completed in 13 turns. Um, the next map is chapter six, and that's one of the hardest maps in the game, but we're well set up for it and have everything we need to get the lowest turn count there. Uh, we do the final step of that preparation by promoting Ash right now, which gives him very good stat bonuses and an all-important point of move and makes him one of our strongest units. At this point, he is basically somewhat stronger Zayed, who unfortunately can't use cutlasses. Um, and we grab Nina's heal staff, just for posterity's sake, and let Yeri kill a final enemy just to get some more juicy experience. So I will see you next time with the dreaded Chapter 6.